But once you get a book in the popular press, people really start to pay attention. And this book by psychologist Daniel Goleman came out in 1995. Uh, it was a number one bestseller. The title is Emotional Intelligence, Why It Can Matter More Than IQ. Um, so this book really launched a public interest in emotional intelligence. Up until then, it was a fairly obscure research topic um, that a handful of academics were interested in. Um, after this book came out, you know, it appeared on Oprah Winfrey, it was on the cover of Time magazine, emotional intelligence was voted uh, one of the most useful new phrases by the American Dialectical Society, and it just took off. I mean, there were really a lot of um, businesses and human resources consultants who started using this term, who started really embracing the concept of emotional intelligence. And this is the basis. It's this book. This book was not based on empirical studies of emotional intelligence, because um, there were no tests of it at the time. There was no way of doing research on it. Instead, what Goldman did was come up with some broad ideas about how he thought that a range of emotional skills could be a lot more important for success in life than the IQ or intelligence quotient. So this is broad ideas it, um, based on a diverse range of findings from social psychology, uh, from um, some brain research, from educational psychology and from business. But there wasn't actually any empirical studies of emotional intelligence that went into this book. So given that there was actually no real evidence that emotional intelligence really did anything, why did it become so popular so quickly? Um, one of the things I think that you have to understand was what was going on in psychological testing in the mid to late 1990s. And the biggest controversy at the time was a book called The Bell Curve. So I've got a reference to The Bell Curve here, it's by um, Hernstein and Murray, called The Bell Curve Intelligence and Class Structure in American Life. So what this book proposed was that differences, uh, group differences between African American and white people in America in their IQ explained different levels of success between white Americans and African Americans. So it's been known for a while, there's a large body of evidence that as illustrated in this graph, white Americans tend to score, on average, 15 IQ points higher than African Americans. Um, there's also a lot of overlap, but the mean um, between you know, African Americans and white Americans, but the mean tends to be higher. The average score is higher for white people. Um, why the bell curve was controversial was not simply stating this difference, but positing that it was probably genetic in origin, probably unchangeable through training, and was responsible for different rates of success, so different rates of college completion, incarceration, um, earnings, average earnings between these different races. So this was very controversial, as you might imagine. It was a bit of a bombshell. People really wanted to distance themselves from intelligence and IQ testing and get away from these like old bossy white racist guys. And just no one wanted, no one wanted to be all about IQ testing. So the public was really ripe for believing in alternative explanations for success. They were really looking for an alternative to the intelligence quotient to explain success in life. And emotional intelligence, particularly, particularly as um, conceptualised by Goleman, was posited as an alternative. So this becomes even more obvious when you think about the way that it's often referred to as EQ, your emotion quotient, and held in stark contrast to IQ, your intelligence quotient. So we have in this sort of popular conception of emotional intelligence, the idea that it is somehow very, very different from IQ, that it's contrast with IQ and it's a better explanation for why people succeed and a more palatable explanation for why people succeed in life. So I'm finally getting to what I hope is really the guts of this presentation today, and that's evaluating some early claims about emotional intelligence. And one of the major claims is that emotional intelligence is in fact more important than IQ for job performance. Um, at the time when this was first 
commonly believed. There was no research base to evaluate whether it was true. Now there is. We now have enough, enough research so that this can be summarised with a statistical technique called meta-analysis, which is just a way of summarising different papers, different research findings. So what do the results say? So we know from a meta-analysis by Schmidt and Hunter in 1998, shown here in red, um, that if we know the differences between people in their IQ, um, we can explain 25% of the differences in their job performance. So differences in IQ can account for about a quarter of the difference in job performance. So they made this estimate based on 32,000 people doing 515 kinds of jobs. So how does emotional intelligence compare to that? We don't have 32,000 people. We have 562 people available to make an estimate about this um, based on eight studies. And Dana Joseph and Dan Newman, in that green reference there, they summarised um, this literature. Here it is. <laughs> Emotional intelligence explains approximately 3% of the differences in how people perform on their jobs. But wait, you might be thinking. Some jobs really don't require much human interaction. Like There really are jobs where there's just some slob sitting in the back room doing technical stuff, never client facing, um, you know, questionable personal hygiene. These people, emotional intelligence is not going to affect how they do their work. And this is something that Dana and Dan considered. So they split the jobs out into those kinds of jobs where, um, in fact, expressing positive emotions was part of the job. This is referred to as a high emotion labour job, where um, compared to those kind of jobs where you really don't, it doesn't matter what emotion you express at work. And these are low emotional labour jobs. So when we look, um, when we look at that, we'll see that for these slobs in the back room, there's absolutely no relationship. I can't even see a coloured bar there um, between emotional intelligence and their performance at work. For the people in high emotion labour jobs, those that have to have service with a smile or something like that, emotional intelligence can explain about 7% of the differences in job performance. However, is emotional intelligence more important than IQ for job performance? No. <laughs> it's, it's, it's clearly not. And the reason why I harp on this point so much is there's still so many websites that make this claim um, that, that it's still very much in the popular press and it's just not true. <laughs> However, moving on, given that this claim is false, is emotional intelligence just a bunch of crap? Is it a fad? I don't think so. I, I think it's useful for a couple of reasons which I'll outline. The first one is, even though it looks kind of not great next to um, intelligence on that graph. Explaining 7% of performance is non-trivial. If I can increase my efficiency by 7%, that's equivalent to an additional three or four weeks per year of work. I can do a lot in an additional three weeks of work. I can sell a lot more widgets, or in my field, I can publish a lot more papers if I've got three extra weeks to do it in. Um, so 7% is, is non-trivial. We're all obsessed with saying it has to be better than intelligence. I think it just has to be useful. Um, the second reason why I think this 7% is non-trivial is that there's a lot of complex jobs out there where there really are very little difference between people in terms of IQ. Um, so these are jobs where everyone has to be smart just to do the jobs. When there are no differences between people in IQ, pretty much, then you can't explain differences in their job performance in terms of differences in their IQ, because there are none. In these jobs, other things explain job performance. So for, an, for example, in a job where everybody is smart, but some people are actually also able to carry on um, a conversation and smile at people and be reasonable um, in terms of social skills as a manager, they're going to do a lot better even though they're just as smart. So for jobs where there are no differences in IQ, where that 25% just disappears, 
you still need other things to explain differences in job performance. Um, the second thing that I wanted to get to is possibly a controversial statement to make while my boss is in the audience, but job performance is not the be all and end all. It's not the most important thing in life. Um, most people would, are also interested in outcomes in their personal life, like being able to cope with stress and feeling happy and self-fulfilled. So emotional intelligence does a better job at explaining these things than it does at explaining job performance. Um, so in my research, I've found that differences in emotional intelligence, specifically in emotion management, explain 10 to 15% of the differences in how well people can cope with stress. Um, also differences in emotional intelligence, again, in that highest branch emotion management, can explain nearly one third of the differences in well-being, and I've specified that this is eudaimonic well-being, um, which is the type of well-being associated with optimum psychological function, reaching your goals. So not just being generally happy, but feeling that you're sort of self-actualised, that you're going somewhere, and you know this this is important. But I did want to get to the point where I could actually answer the question that I started this talk with. Is emotional intelligence fact or fad? And the unexciting answer is that it's at neither extreme. The truth is out there. The truth is in the middle, as it is for most things. Um, it's certainly not the cure-all elixir that earlier claims suggest. Um, it's not more important than intelligence for job performance, as is still suggested um, in various um, forums, um, particularly outside of academia for people in their consultancies. Although emotional intelligence predicts job performance, it does so really for emotion-related jobs only, and it does predict emotion-related outcomes. So this is a useful set of skills to consider when you're considering emotion-related outcomes, but you can't just apply it all over the place. So my conclusion is, let's throw the bathwater out, um, all these early claims which are way over the top, but let's keep the baby. Now with the emotional intelligence, like all humans have emotions, so then of course we have the different levels. Now with the productivity side, would we have any emotions at all for a better outcome business related wise? No. <laughs> Um, I will elaborate on that, uh, but it obviously depends vastly on the job, but I mean, if you don't have any emotions at all, if you completely don't see any emotions that other people are experiencing, you miss a lot of information, um, particularly if you're in the sort of client-focused role where you're trying to get people to buy stuff. You need, you need to have those cues as to when they're about to cave in and you know, buy it or wh whether they're feeling genuinely anxious. Those sorts of cues are important. Um, even for, um, there's a, some research going on into how emotional intelligence is important for dealing with people who are trying to get their superannuation out now that there's been this global financial crisis and you do need to be able to read people's emotions um, to determine you know, how, how anxious they are and what advice you should give them. So, yeah, you, it's not better to have none at all. You miss information. Uh, hi, I just wanted to ask, um, what kind of correlations are there between IQ and EI? And also, um, when it comes to the variations between coping and stress and um, happiness and well-being, how much of that variation is explained by IQ? Um, in answer to your first question, I think that the meta-analytic estimates between emotional intelligence and various aspects of um, IQ show that there's about a 0.3 correlation, and it's not with um, fluid reasoning ability, it's with your crystallised or acculturated knowledge, your, um, your knowledge base, your knowledge rather than your reasoning. Um, so that 0.3 is explaining 10%. Um, in answer to how much of happiness is due to 
um, intelligence. I don't know from that study particularly, um, but I'm, try I'm trying to think if there actually is a study that just looks at intelligence and happiness. So I, I, I can't, I couldn't tell you. Okay. On that note, please join with me in thanking Carolyn for a really wonderful lecture. This is Big Ideas from the ABC.